One of the most outrageous recent decisions by our government has been to only raise benefits by 3% when prices are rising by 8%. That's a real and deep pay cut for Britain's poorest. Well, this week Boris Johnson was challenged on that, and he came up with a new reason why protecting the incomes of the poorest would be simply impossible. Let's take a look. Do you know how much the carer's allowance went up per week back well, in April? I, I can imagine... Do that you it know was, I can't answer. give you the figure, but I can imagine that it was not enough in the short term to cope with it the went costs. Up. Their what, carer's what? allowance is £69.70 a week. It went up by just over £2 a week. You're not doing enough for people. Can I just explain the, the problem that we, we face? Uh, we have a, a short-term hit caused by the spike in energy prices uh, across the world. If we respond uh, by driving up uh, prices and costs across the board in this country, uh, responding by the government stepping in and, and driving up inflation, uh, that will hit everybody, uh, and that will mean that people's interest rates on their mortgages go up, the cost of borrowing goes up, and we face an even worse problem. You... We're already, can I just explain? We're already spending £83 billion a year to service the cost of government debt. Mm -hmm. That's huge. That's far more than we spend on, uh, on defence, uh, on, on many other budgets across Whitehall. It's a huge sum of money. And the risk is... If we have an inflationary spiral uh, of the kind that could be triggered, then you'll, see then you'll see interest rates going up, and that will hit people in their mortgages. Have you seen and, inflation? And, and that's, and that, inflation and that's... could hit 10%. Correct. And you know who's Correct. not getting their payments uprated in line with inflation? It's people on benefits. Why not? For the reason that I've given. We don't want to... Because although you're quite right to point out that there is an inflationary risk and it's very severe, it could get worse. And that knocks on to interest rates and that knocks on to the cost of borrowing for everybody. So the argument there is that if the state were to borrow more to protect the incomes of the poor, that would only further inflation. And then, so the argument goes, the Bank of England would have to raise interest rates to suppress demand and homeowners would have to pay more for their mortgages. To me, at least, it doesn't sound fair to suppress the incomes of the poor to protect cheap mortgages for the relatively well off. But beyond that basic question of social justice, do the economics behind Boris Johnson's claim even make sense? Earlier today, I spoke to economist and Tribune staff writer Grace Blakely. So what Boris Johnson has done here is a classic um, political tactic of presenting a succession of things that are themselves political choices as inevitabilities. So his argument is basically, if we increase wages or um, benefits or um, we kind of redistribute in order to deal with the inflationary crisis, then we'll get something called a wage price spiral, which is something that um, economists were very worried about during the 1970s, which was when you saw rising costs, you then saw unions demanding wage increases in line with inflation, um, and then uh, bosses trying to deal with that by rise, raising their prices, and then it becomes a kind of competitive spiral. Um, what this uh, whole idea of the wage price spiral actually highlights is that inflation is a, a political problem. It's a political question. It's about who's going to be made to pay for, uh, in this case, rising energy costs um, and supply chain issues that are causing um, costs to rise across the board. And by saying we can't increase uh, benefits, we can't raise wages because it will push inflation, what that is actually saying is it's going to be working people, it's going to be the poorest people in society who are going to pick up the costs of inflation. And then the next step of that argument is to say, and then to deal with inflation, we will have to, the central bank will have to raise interest rates, which is the only way really that economists have to deal with inflation. Um, and that will then cause people's debt servicing costs to increase. Now, again, that is not an inevitability. There are lots of ways of dealing with inflation, and particularly when inflation is coming from what economists refer to as the supply side. So, to do with kind of, um, you know, issues with supply chains, to do with exogenous shocks, um, rather than things to do with demand, 
then it doesn't really make sense to increase interest rates because the transmission mechanism as to how interest rates are linked with inflation is supposedly that when people borrow lots of money, uh, when businesses borrow lots of money for investment, they create new jobs. When they create new jobs, they hire more people. When they hire more people, um, there is a tighter labor market, which means higher wages. Um, and then you've got you know, more spending in all these different areas of the economy, which, which causes it to overheat. That is emphatically not the problem that we have today. So raising interest rates to make borrowing more expensive and prevent businesses from investing and preventing them from hiring more workers isn't going to do anything to tackle that problem of energy costs. It's just, again, going to force borrowers and workers to pick up the tab. So this whole thing is a very, very political question. And Boris Johnson has cleverly, as you know, these politicians, particularly neoliberal politicians, are wont to do, very cleverly um, taken this political question and disguised it in kind of complex economic terminology to make it seem as though it's just a kind of technocratic issue. And it's all about just solving this narrow economic problem of how we reduce inflation. Whereas actually what we're dealing with here is a political question, who's going to pay for inflation? Can we talk about specifically what's causing the inflation we're currently seeing and how that affects how we should respond to it? So on the one side, you've got supply side inflation. So that's people talking about the, the war in Ukraine or or shortages um, in, you know, in factories in China or whatever. The other side is, is demand side. So that could be that people are demanding too many goods. Incomes are too high. And especially here, you might talk about the government printing a lot of money during the coronavirus pandemic. Which one of these are we looking at? If we had, were having kind of demand driven inflation, it would be an imbalance between levels of demand in the economy and the amount of stuff that we have and are able to produce. So let's say, you know, everyone's earning loads of money, businesses are doing loads of investment, and it's just like impossible to get access to the stuff that you need to, you know, I don't know, let's say produce your goods and services or, you know, the consumer goods that you need. And so in that very competitive marketplace where lots of people are saying, I want this, I want this, I want this, prices go up because there's lots of bidders basically for those goods. Um, there are some areas of the economy where this is true. So um, say like construction, for example, um, because there's lots of, there's still kind of a relatively high amount of demand um, for uh, construction materials and things. There's lots of bidders um, and there are also supply constraints, but that's kind of limited because obviously what we are going through right now is a very, very deep economic crisis. There aren't lots of people scrambling to buy loads of things. There aren't lots of businesses scrambling to undertake loads of investment unless you look at the very, very top end of the economy where there are people, there's currently like a shortage of private jet hangers because so many people have private jets. Um, so there is, there are areas where that is true, certainly. And again, that has to do with QE and the impact on wealth inequality. But actually what we're really looking at, and this is what economists mean when they say supply side, are issues around supply. Now, there are two factors that are primarily affecting this. And you will have heard these things said, but I'll just kind of explain what they mean. So first, obviously, it's energy prices. And secondly, there are supply chain issues. Now, with energy prices, you'll remember during the pandemic, um, there was a time at which oil prices hit zero. Now, that was partly because of the shutdown of the economy itself. So, you know, people obviously weren't demanding as much oil. It wasn't being used in the production processes. Trade was shut down. Um, and it also had to do with some kind of complications around the way that futures contracts were arranged. Um, I won't go into that. It's very boring. Uh, but, you know, oil price effectively hit zero because it wasn't being used. So obviously, if we're thinking about supply and demand, the people who supply the oil then look at that and think, well, what, why would it, you know, profit us to supply oil when prices are this low? We're going to hold back. And there was this narrative that this was going to kind of push the renewables revolution because existing fossil fuel suppliers would see that it's not profitable to produce fossil fuels anymore and they would all move into renewables. Of course, that turned out to be wildly over optimistic, not least because they have a lot of investment in existing um, projects already that they need to complete. But obviously, when the economy reopened and demand for fossil fuels then skyrocketed, you had these problems around constraints in supply, which meant that um, prices then skyrocketed and it went the opposite direction. Then you had these geopolitical tensions and all these issues around, um, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, and that made the whole situation much worse and much worse, obviously, in particular markets as well. So this problem with natural gas is obviously a much bigger supply issue in Europe than it is in other parts of the world. Um, so there's the energy issue on the one hand. Then there's also these issues around supply chains. Now, 
this is interesting and complex. I find this super interesting as like an economics nerd. Um, if you just take the example of, say, global shipping, right? Shipping is this highly interconnected um, and very fragile system where over the years you had um, containerization leading to the creation of, of just these massive, huge container ships that can carry astonishing amounts of goods. And they're very, uh, they, they can only go into certain ports. They take a very long time to load and unload. And the whole system has to be very, very finely tuned so that, you know, one boat comes in, it's unloaded, it leaves, another boat comes in immediately afterwards. Um, and that all collapsed during the pandemic. Um, so the like, you know, finely tuned network that governed global shipping broke down. There were loads of ships that were stuck at sea for ages. This was disastrous for the crews that were on there who were stuck at sea for ages. It also meant that um, just a load of goods couldn't be um, unloaded, couldn't be reloaded. Ports were closed. There weren't the workers available, etc. Then when the economy reopened, suddenly there was all this demand and um, there were huge. There was a huge backlog because of the ships that had been stuck at sea. So these huge queues outside some of the major ports. Um, and this basically continued in one form or another for years. It was it, it's still continuing to this day, actually, um, particularly around China, where it's, it's still very difficult at the moment to um, load and unload because of the lockdowns in Shanghai. That also those kind of issues around supply did also interact with an issue around demand, which was that demand for physical goods increased during the pandemic because demand for services had fallen. So there was more basically physical trade taking place, even as the infrastructure was crumbling. So what happened? And this is the key question. Again, this all sounds very technical, but this is why it's political. The reason that that had a massive impact on inflation and is still having a big impact on inflation is because the global shipping companies, there are a few massive global shipping companies that control the vast majority of um, shipping trade. They're basically an oligopoly and they cooperate and collude with one another. There's no antitrust regulation that's imposed over these ships. They just sent prices through the roof. So shipping costs just utterly exploded during the pandemic in a way that we hadn't really ever seen. And that impacts the price of pretty much every good that has to be imported. And in an import dependent economy like ours, like the US, that's going to have a bigger impact on inflation. How should the left respond to inflation? I mean, it's, it's been a question that we haven't had to worry about for a while because there's been decades of very low inflation. It used to be a very tense question for the left to answer. That was one of the reasons why you know, the, the Keynesian consensus broke down at the end of the 1970s. How should we be responding to this? How do we reassure people that we've got an answer to inflation and, and what is that answer? Yeah, I mean, you know, this is, I think, the same as, um, well, we should be using the same framework to respond to this question as any other question. Um, not starting with this technical point around, uh, you know, where should we be raising interest rates? Where should we be, um, you know, constraining wages, all these different sorts of things, but actually starting with the question of who is going to pay for this inflationary crisis. And that is really how we need to be framing all of these issues, because whilst politicians on the right are very, very keen to say we need to avoid a wage price spiral. So let's raise interest rates which is going to help creditors and potentially increase unemployment and punish workers. They're not going to say all the chain, all the links in that chain. They're just going to say wage price spiral, that's bad economics, so we raise interest rates. We need to expose the links in that chain, so basically tell people that what they're saying is working people, you're going to be the ones who are going to have to pay for this inflationary crisis, which people already know because they're feeling it in their pockets, um, and then say this doesn't have to be this way. Which it doesn't, because one thing that we're not talking about, you know, politicians are very, very happy to talk about the fact that um, oh, wages are increasing by this amount each year. By the way, wages aren't increasing as fast as inflation by any stretch of the imagination, which means most people are experiencing currently a real terms pay cut. Bear in mind that before that, we'd had a decade of wage stagnation, which meant that in the UK, you know, between 2008 and 2018, the average worker didn't see their pay increase at all. In the US, um, Average pay in purchasing power parity terms was effectively the same in 1979 as it was in 2018. So the idea that like workers are, ha you know, doing really well out of this crisis because they have loads of bargaining power and are able to demand wage increases in line with inflation, it's just living in a fantasy land. Um, the people who, the, the, the part of this conversation that we're not having is the extent to which profits are driving inflation. Because, of course, it's not just wages that can be leading to an increase in, in demand and pushing up costs. It's also profits. And corporate profits have skyrocketed 
um, over well, the last 40 years, really, and especially actually over the last two years when we've had these massive windfall profits that have come from big corporations, um, and many of which have been distributed to shareholders, uh, have exacerbated wealth inequality. Um, and we're not talking at all about the extent to which that is driving inflation, particularly in house prices, because a lot of that money is being driven back into property markets. Is there an even simpler way of putting this and saying it's about profits being too big and just saying it's about the consumption habits of the rich? So the argument I think Boris Johnson is putting forward is saying if you give poorer people more money, they'll spend more money and that will drive demand. Well, isn't the response to that to just say, well, what about the rich people spending more money? What about them driving demand? Let's tax their wealth. And if we tax their wealth, we can take some demand out of the system, but from the people who can actually afford to have that demand taken, who, who can afford to have that consumption power taken from them. Would that be a reasonable response? Yeah, totally. Um, and when you frame that as well as not just in terms of like wealthy people, but also big corporations, then the argument is even more compelling. Um, what they will say is that the effect of that isn't going to be big enough to have a significant enough impact as opposed to kind of constraining wages across the, the income spectrum. Um, and there is a point there because it's not just uh, the very, very wealthiest uh, that would, you know, have to, that, we, that we're looking at in terms of like the, the distribution of the pain here. Um, if we're really thinking about like how we balance the costs of inflation, we have to bear in mind the long held neoliberal fear that inflation actually erodes asset values. So if we are going to, let's say, um, provide subsidies for working class households to be able to maintain a basic level of living standards to get through this crisis, as well as taxing the rich um, and kind of holding, trying to kind of hold um, salaries at the top end of the income spectrum relatively constant, then what you will see is that those who have a greater um, amount of wealth held in assets or like, uh, you know, rely more on assets for their income, say, uh, will be harmed more than those who rely on incomes that are being uprated with inflation. Um, so that is about house prices as well, which is why it's a really hot political topic. Um, but obviously, you know, saying that like house prices need to come down relative to incomes is not something that I think is going to be controversial for the vast majority of people in this country. Um, it's just a question of, again, how it's framed. And are we are we able to say, and really actually like push back against this neoliberal argument that the only thing that you should be worrying about is the value of your house and the value of your pension. And actually saying, well, no, we need to be thinking about increasing people's incomes. We need to be thinking about affordability. And we need to be thinking about actually the structure of the economy long term and how we're going to push for the green transition that is going to create a livable planet um, for your children. There will, of course, be reaction that will be like, no, the only thing I care about is the value of my home. But I think it's questionable um, how politically um, relevant that will be or that argument will be going forward as this crisis gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And even people who do have some housing wealth start to see their incomes eroded to such an extent that they are actually struggling as well. The cost of living crisis is the central issue facing most Britons right now. Energy bills are rocketing, food prices are rising and wages and benefits are not catching up. And it's in this context that top Tories are sounding ever more out of touch. Watch how Boris Johnson responds to this question on Good Morning Britain. We get emails all the time, Prime Minister, about this. You have said that individuals have to make choices about what they spend their money on. You've, you're on record as saying that, OK? And I want to ask you then about a number of our viewers who have got in touch with us about the choices that they're making. Elsie is 77. She's a widow and she's a pensioner who lives in a council house. She receives a pension of £170 a week. Her energy bills have gone, get this, from £17 a month to £85 a month. Yeah. She will pay an additional £816 a year. To cut down on spending, Prime Minister, Elsie has now resorted to eating one meal a day. She's 77 years old. She's losing weight. She goes to the supermarket at the end of the day to buy yellow sticker discounted items. She gets up early in the morning to use her Freedom Bus Pass to stay on buses all day to avoid using energy at home. What else should Elsie cut back on? In your well, opinion? I don't want Elsie to cut back on anything. Let's talk about, about Elsie and what we're, uh, what we're, what we're doing. And I just remind you that the, uh, the 24-hour Freedom Bus Pass was something that I actually 
introduced, just just parenthetically. Marvellous. So Elsie should but, be grateful but, but, to you no, for her bus no, pass. But, so that was Boris Johnson's response to a 77-year-old woman who stays on the bus all day because she can't afford to eat her heat her home. Sorry, you should be grateful for your bus pass. I brought in her freedom pass, so now she can pass the days in the warmth of a bus. How wonderful of me. Now 77-year-olds can hang around on buses instead of in their homes, which are freezing because energy is, is so expensive and I haven't raised their pensions or benefits by a, uh, a large enough amount. Um, I'm joined now by Dahlia Gabriel. Um, Dahlia, lovely to have you on the show this evening. I've seen that exchange described as Boris Johnson's Marie Antoinette moment. Let them eat cake. What did you make of it? Well, um, firstly, of course, uh, concessionary, concessionary bus travel for pensioners was actually introduced uh, in 1973, not by Boris Johnson, but by the Greater London Council, uh, which is a governing body that was abolished by Thatcher for being too left wing. Um, it's actually in that Tory war against the GLC that the term loony left, which and obviously frequently indulges in, uh, it's where that term became really popularized. So before I start, you know, just a little corrective history there, because I think it's really important that we don't let the Tories get away with claiming credit for things that we now enjoy and now have um, that they actually at the time fought tooth and nail against. Uh, so that's, I think, really important to, to clarify um, on, on that point. But, but what this clip really brings home to me, and I've said this a couple of times before, is that Boris Johnson is not this savvy media player or media communicator that we are often that he's often portrayed to be. His his political rise has has not been the result of some kind of innate intelligence or skill. And you can see uh, in that clip, he's just a well networked posh boy who had vast swathes of institutional connection and support, which has helped essentially to conceal his cruelty and, and lack of competence uh, from the general public. When, when put under the most basic scrutiny, as we saw in that clip, literally just, and we saw this again, uh, I think it was, was last week when we had Keir Starmer uh, reading out that that story about about the um, one of his constituents, and it was kind of claimed that, oh, you know, you are you are uh, manip being manipulative, or you're kind of exploiting this story for for emotion. When the most basic scrutiny is brought to him in the most minorly difficult conditions, as I said, he falls apart. His fundamental incompetence and cruelty, uh, the fact that he doesn't see. Uh, the public as full human beings in the way that he sees himself and people of his class as it comes through very, very starkly. And so that that Teflon nature uh, that he seems to have, that ability to rise through the ranks despite scandal after scandal and despite offering the British people not even nothing, but actually less than nothing, actually taking away from the British people. It's because of a choice that is made consistently by the media and political establishment in this country to force us to forget things that we've seen with our own eyes and we've heard with our own uh, ears. Like, could you imagine if, if Boris Johnson was put under the kind of consistent scrutiny that Jeremy Corbyn is put was put under? Like, his career would, wouldn't have lasted for 20 minutes, let alone uh, 20 years. And so... What that interview just really tells me is how much of how much Boris Johnson's career has been the result of the protection of very, very powerful institutions rather than his own ability to sell himself and sell his ideas. Because when he's when he's put to perform in any kind of raw or or uncontrolled environment, he repeatedly shows himself to be actually a pretty rubbish communicator and pretty rubbish politician. And so it just goes to show, I think, how success in this domain is really in part manufactured and decided by the extent to which your mistakes and your scandals 
are hyped up and and embedded in the public consciousness by the media and how much the media is actually complicit in other instances of of covering up for your scandals, as we've seen uh, throughout the career of Boris Johnson. I mean, I take your point. I do think Boris Johnson has been able to get away with murder. And it, it, I, I absolutely agree. If he was put under the same scrutiny that Jeremy Corbyn had been, his career would have been over, as you say, in 20 minutes. But that was an effective interview, I think, from Susanna Reid there, potentially why Boris Johnson had refused to go on Good Morning Britain for the past five years. And the reason it was effective is because she put those human experiences to him. And his fatal flaw, you know, his fatal flaw isn't really that he lies, I think, or, or, or you know, or that he breaks rules. So he has no compassion for people. He, he just does not care about ordinary working class people. He couldn't care less. It, it was so obvious in that clip that he was in no way moved by that very, I mean, tragic story, really, that, that was told to him. Someone who spends all day on a bus because they can't heat their house. This is someone who is 77. Someone who is 77 eats one meal a day. He's told all of that. He looks a little bit irritated and said, well, it was me who introduced the bus pass. Now, I think that the specifics of this is you're absolutely right, Dali. The, the, the Freedom Pass was introduced in 1973. I think Boris Johnson's defence is he introduced the 24-hour Freedom Pass when he was London mayor, which I suppose means that now if you can't afford to live in a house, you should be grateful to Boris Johnson because now you can ride the buses 24 hours a day to try and keep warm in case you can't afford to, to heat your own flat. These are very low standards um, or a very low threshold, which he is celebrating, which he sort of wants us to thank him for. We've got one more out of touch Tory for you now. This was George Eustace on Sky News. So what's your advice to people then who want a Sunday roast with a chicken for the family, but they can't afford it? Well, the, um, the, the thing to bear in mind is that if you look at household spending uh, on food in the UK, it's actually, you know, the lowest in Europe, partly because we've got uh, that very competitive market. Uh, it used to be for the poorest 20% of households, about 16% of their income used to go on food. That dropped a few years ago to about 14%. It's going to rise again now, but generally speaking, you know, what people find is that by going for some of the sort of value brands rather than... Uh, uh, you know, own branded uh, products, they can actually sort of contain and, and manage their household budget. So that was the Environment Secretary arguing that if poor people are struggling with the increasing cost of living, they should switch to buying value goods. Now, value goods, goods have, have existed for a while on supermarket shelves. So I think someone needs to ask that guy, who was buying these in the first place? What was the demand for these value goods? It wasn't from George Eustace and his mates who are really, really smart with money, so they know how to get the right deals. No, it was poor people who were already buying the value goods. You can't tell people who are already buying value goods, oh, well, if, you, if you're struggling with the cost of living, switch to what you're already buying. You know, if that's his advice, the only implication is that he's happy for people to go hungry. They should buy less of the cheaper goods they were already buying. Dalia, what's your response to George Eustace? And I suppose, you know, just the general attitude that the Tories are, are displaying uh, on this question of the cost of living. Well, I mean, it's an attitude as, as old as neoliberalism itself, arguably of, of capitalism itself. What, what George Eustace is engaging in here is the tried and tested neoliberal strategy of framing systemic issues as matters of personal failing. Uh, so you don't have intergenerational wealth? Well, it's your parents' fault for not working hard enough. Or you can't save money because landlords have been allowed to charge half your income in rent? Well, it's your fault for eating too many avocado toasts. Or you grew up in a school with no funding? Well, you didn't pull your bootstraps hard enough. You didn't revise your exams hard enough. Uh, you know, you work three jobs, but because the minimum wage hasn't risen in line with inflation, uh, you still have barely any savings in your bank account. Well, that sounds like a you problem. You didn't uh, you didn't manage your money enough. You didn't manage your you didn't meal prep um, enough. So we have very deliberate sets of policies that not only restrict the ability of people to decide their own lives, but they actively redistribute wealth and take wealth from working people in this country to the very rich. And then those working class people are then sold moralizing narratives that encourage them to either blame themselves or, as is often the case, blame those who are more worse off than they are uh, for their own exploitation. And what really 
frustrates and enrages me, and it's something that I don't know how they've gotten away with for so long, is that these narratives of personal responsibility and, and rugged individualism are being crafted and sold to us by people whose success is entirely predicated upon other people. Their wealth is entirely created by other people, whether it's the workers that they exploit to make their money or the nannies and domestic workers that do all of their uh, domestic work at home. People who, who, as we've seen throughout this entire party gate uh, scenario, who have never taken personal responsibility for anything. They don't even know how to do it. So it's it's distasteful and shocking to see it in this particular uh, instance because of the fact that the cost of living crisis is on the front page of every news and the fact that I think increasingly in this situation, which we didn't see under austerity, we are seeing the media being more willing to point the finger at policymakers rather than going along with the narrative that this is inevitable, that you know we need to balance the budget, et cetera. So whilst we're seeing it in quite sharp relief in that interview, particularly when it's juxtaposed uh, by the story of Elsie that we heard earlier on in the segment, this is the actually the fundamental logic upon which our economic system is based. It's the fundamental narrative uh, under which our economic system runs. It's a way of selling neoliberalism as a false meritocracy, where the myth is that you you get back what you put in. Uh, but obviously, we know that it's the people who put in the most in terms of their labor, in terms of their time, in terms of their effort. Often, those are the people that are getting the crumbs. They are getting the very least out of that economic system. So, it's put on perfect display by George Eustace there, but it's not a logic, it's not a narrative that was invented by George Eustace. It's actually pretty much the normative logic um, that has been embedded in our culture for the past 20 to 30 years. That comparison between how austerity was covered, I do think is super interesting. And that was that was one of the main thoughts I had actually watching um, both of those clips, especially the one with Susanna Reid, is that you know what she did, which was so powerful, was basically put forward the position of someone who's in an impossible situation, they're, they're having a rubbish time and there is nothing they can do to stop that, to change that. And I was thinking, you know, why didn't we see any interviews like that during the period of austerity? Because, you know, during that time, my mum was a welfare rights advisor. So she'd tell people, you know, what options you have to try and keep your head above water given the austerity cuts that were going forward. And, you know, a lot like Martin Lewis now, you know, she wasn't on on ITV or anything, but she was. She was. There is nothing you can do. You know, it's it, it. It was really tragic because people are having all of these benefits cut to the point where you cannot live. A, you're pushed into destitution essentially. There's nothing you can do about it. But you didn't see interviews like that because I think the Tories had been so effective of saying that anyone who is suffering from austerity, that's essentially their fault, and the media went along with it for one reason or another. The media are less willing to go along with it this time. You know, thank God. But the fact that they were happy to go along with it, you know, in, in the 2010s. It does make me, you know, I, I'm not filled with faith in them, basically. It seems like this is very contingent. There is something about this particular crisis because it's so difficult to blame it on, on the poor because, you know, while they managed to argue that it was overspending and lazy people that caused the financial crisis, I mean, that was a remarkable feat of trickery, right? But but they managed it. it was clearly doable because they did it and it was successful no one seems to have found a way that you can blame the war in ukraine or coronavirus on on working class laziness so you know the, the media aren't falling into line this time to the same degree that they did back in the 2010 so i mean you know something to be grateful for but it's not really something i am you know going to celebrate our media for that it, it took that it took coronavirus and a war for them to take seriously the idea that maybe people being pushed into poverty isn't a good thing or a fair thing they've realized that now thank god if only they'd realised it 12 years ago. Leaked documents have revealed that the US Supreme Court is poised to overturn the ruling that made abortion legal across the United States. The draft ruling was authored by Samuel Alito, who was nominated by George W. Bush, and it effectively overturns the historic Roe v. Wade case of 1973, leaving it up to states to decide whether to ban abortion. The reaction across the US was immediate. Here's Elizabeth Warren. Because of who will pay the price for this? It will not be wealthy women. Wealthy women can get on an airplane 
They can fly to another state. They can fly to another country. They can get the protection they need. This will fall on the poorest women in our country. This will fall on the young women who have been abused, who are victims of incest. This will fall on those who have been raped. This will fall on mothers who are already struggling to work three jobs to be able to support the children they have. Well, I am here because I am angry, and I am here because the United States Congress can change all of this. That was a really, really powerful response from Elizabeth Warren. Um, Joe Biden's response, as you can imagine, was a little bit more underwhelming. So he said, if the court does overturn Roe, it will fall on our nation's elected officials at all levels of government to protect a woman's right to choose. And it will fall on voters to elect pro-choice officials this November. At the federal level, we will need more pro-choice senators and a pro-choice majority in the House to adopt legislation that codifies Roe, which I will work to pass and sign into law. Now, telling people to vote to save Roe v. Wade when the Democrats currently control the White House and both houses of Congress hasn't gone down well in all quarters for obvious reasons. Back to the draft judgment, though. The ruling the court looks set to overturn relates to a case brought by Norma McCorvey in 1971. McCorvey wanted to have an abortion for an unwanted pregnancy, but she lived in Texas where it was illegal in all but extreme cases. In court documents, McCorvey was referred to as Jane Roe. The district attorney in Texas was Henry Wade, hence Roe v. Wade. In that instance, the court sided with Roe, judging that decisions about abortion were covered by an individual's constitutional right to privacy. And ever since, states have been barred from banning abortion. But because of an inbuilt right-wing majority on the Supreme Court, this is now set to change, and the judges drew upon some pretty bizarre reasoning. This is Astrid Ackerman, a lawyer who works for the Centre for Reproductive Rights in New York, explaining how they came to the decision. They look back at laws from the 1800s criminalizing abortion. And then since that's the time when the Bill of Rights was passed, so then the 14th Amendment, the right to privacy is based on. So the right to due process and to liberty and life and property was passed in the 1800s. So then they look at the laws at that time to see whether it was uh, abortion was legal or not. Now, that is batshit. I don't know how else to describe that. The right to privacy, the right to privacy, sorry, was passed in 1800. And back in 1800, people didn't like abortions. So there's no way the right to privacy, a constitutional right, could protect abortions. Because when they passed it, they didn't like abortions. So whatever they wanted in 1800, that's what the law has to be now. Now, of course, this decision by the Supreme Court won't ban all abortions. It just allows states to ban them if they wish. That's not going to reassure women across vast swathes of the US, though. I asked Astrid Ackerman where the impacts would be most immediate. It's mostly the Midwest and the South. Texas, obviously, Mississippi, Alabama, Midwest, like Ohio, Tennessee, and what we are seeing already is that there are some states passing what, what are called trigger bans. These basically are laws that say that if Roe v. Wade is overturned in part or in whole, then abortion is illegal. So then this will mean that if the Supreme Court does go forward and makes this draft that was leaked on Monday, if they make it the final decision, then all of those states will be able to go forward and ban abortion. And that will be really hard for advocates to challenge this laws in the court. So as as soon as the Supreme Court make this judgment, if they make this judgment, this is just a leaked draft so far, if they make this judgment that Roe v. Wade is no longer legitimate, then there are a bunch of of states across the US who have an automatic law that means the moment Roe v. Wade goes, abortion becomes illegal in that state. Dahlia, uh, your comments on what seems like an extraordinary decision? There are two things here, I think. The the first is that hard-won rights that feel set in stone are actually not set in stone. 
uh, we are often told that the fight for progress, that the fight for rights is a kind of linear trajectory upwards, but we are seeing many issues uh, that we thought were settled being overturned and, and rolled back. So whether it's things that are enshrined in the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, things like right to family life and right to asylum, these things are being rolled back or, or other post-war labor protections like the right to a pension or, or to an eight hour workday. These are rights that we have to consistently fight to defend and, and extend. And so when marginalized groups in particular, because these are often the groups that are the first to lose these rights, when marginalized groups ring the alarm about these kinds of rights being chipped away, we have to be very careful to not just dismiss them as alarmist uh, and think, oh, it might happen to them, but it would never happen to the majority of people. This is a case in point of that not being true. The, the right in the US has been organizing from the grassroots up since the day that Roe v. Wade uh, was passed. They have been organizing uh, for this moment. And we need to be very vigilant about the other areas that they are putting this kind of work into. If this is a success story, um, which it's increasingly looking like it will be, um, then this will be taken as a model uh, for, for the right across the world to, to start to work on other fundamental uh, rights. The second thing that I wanted to talk about, obviously there's been a lot of focus on, on the US, rightly so. And so to think about how this relates to the context here in the UK, we obviously, we don't have the same strain of US evangelism here. We, you know, the evangelical Christianity does not operate as a political force in the same way uh, in this country as it does uh, in the US. Um, abortion is is often very, is barely mentioned. It's not a contentious issue. It's very barely mentioned, uh, particularly obviously in England, Scotland and Wales. It's obviously different in Ireland, but it, it's not uh, talked about often even in elections. It's not mentioned in elections. Um, whereas in the US, you have this very organized contingent of voters who are geographically very strategically located for whom this is the basis on which they vote. So they literally cast their vote on the basis of who uh, is willing to be anti-choice, anti-abortion. And to an extent we are seeing as this, uh, this um, draft was leaked, we've seen some tentative testing out of that messaging here. Um, the, the Times editorial position came out defending the draft ruling under this very flimsy and disingenuous guise of democracy, uh, arguing that, you know, it shouldn't be in the hands of unelected judges, uh, these kinds of decisions, but it should be in the hand of elected officials. And obviously it's when it comes to the right of women to choose the right of women to have bodily autonomy, that's suddenly when we have to reevaluate the entire constitutional and governance structure of, of the US. Uh, we shouldn't be acting surprised that the Supreme Court does make these kinds of decisions and that the Supreme Court is not an elected body. That's not news, um, but trying to play it as this kind of pro-democracy position is an example of the right trying to test the waters here in this moment. But I also think that just because we don't have abortion here being treated as a culture war issue, it doesn't mean that reproductive and gender-based healthcare in this country is not being undermined. It's just happening in a different way. Rather than happening in the package of a culture war, it's happening in the package of an economic war. So when we look at the impact that austerity is, is having on women's reproductive health care and other forms of gender-based health care, uh, we can see, you know, whether that's sexual health services or access to abortion, we can see a similar disdain and systemic undervaluing of women's reproductive health care and bodily autonomy. When you look at cuts to abortion services, uh, being cut to the bone, particularly in, in rural areas, to the point where you have 3.2 million women a year uh, reporting that they have trouble accessing sexual health and contraceptive services, where, where budget cuts uh, are dictating rather than what women actually need, 
uh, the availability and the kinds of abortion and reproductive health services that are available are instead being being dictated by what is being funded by budget cuts. When according to the TUC, um, at one point you had just one specialist abortion clinic for the entirety of Wales. That central right of women to decide if, when, where, and how they may or may not want to have children, that fundamental right has been under attack in this country by austerity. Because let's not forget as well, reproductive rights isn't just about choosing not to have children. It's also about choosing to have children. And that fundamental right as well uh, has been under attack in this country by the, the shrinking of benefits, by the, the cap on, on child benefits that has been placed at two two children, which was introduced by the Conservative government, the devaluing of women's rights to determine their lives and their reproductive health um, is not might not be coming um, from men in religious garb calling themselves Christians, but it is coming in this country from men in suits who are calling themselves economic, economists, essentially. Um, so I think it's important to look at the different ways in which the state undermines women's bodily autonomy. It's not always as shocking and as clear as we are seeing it unfold in the US, but when you look at the gendered impacts of austerity, it is absolutely, um, there is an economic war on women's bodily autonomy taking place in this country as well. Yeah, it's super interesting. I, I, I like that idea of sort of the right to choose, not just being about the right to choose whether or not to have an abortion and to have an abortion, you know, in a way which is comfortable which is close to your house which is free which is you know you don't have to take loads of time off work and it becomes a real sort of struggle to get that done but also the right to choose being the right to choose to actually have a baby and not live in destitution which is is definitely a right which has been eroded fundamentally in this country over the past 12 years um i'm sure you'll be coming back to this story in the u.s and i mean i do think it is worth noting with those extremists on the Supreme Court, it could get worse. So what it looks like they're about to do is strike down Roe v. Wade, which is going to put it in control of states, whether or not abortion will be legal. But it seems, you know, the logic of saying, what did they think in 1800? Or what did they think in whatever year, you know, this document or these amendments were written, they could easily go back and say, oh, well, in 1800, they thought a person was a fetus, and this protects a person. So you can imagine that that extremist Supreme Court makes abortion illegal across the whole of the United States. It's not it's not out of the realms of, of possibilities. Really, really scary moment for, for Americans and especially American women. The so-called beer gate row has been the Daily Mail's lead story for the past seven, yes, seven days. We won't show you every front page over that period, but for a sense of the tone, the series started last Thursday with this claim that Durham police were going to review Starmer's potential breach of lockdown rules. That wasn't quite true. The cops had simply agreed to consider a request to review the case, and that request had been made by a Tory MP. By Saturday, the Mail was declaring that Labour had been lying about the Beergate event and accused Starmer of orchestrating a cover-up. And on Tuesday, the campaign continued. The Mail's front page led with a column by Richard Littlejohn and called Starmer a hypocrite. Clearly, this is a newspaper with a vendetta. The paper, the Daily Mail, were recently called out for sexist coverage of Angela Rayner and appear keen to do damage to the party before the local elections. They're looking for revenge. But does the cynicism of the Mail mean we should dismiss the story about Starmer? Let's start by getting some facts straight. This footage was taken on the 30th of April 2021 in the office of Labour MP for the city of Durham, Mary Foy. Um, it shows Starmer drinking a beer with four or five other people in the room, including Foy. One of those people is eating something from a plate. The Sun has now got details of the takeaway order that was put in that night. Um, credit where it's due. This is a good headline. Backed into a coma. And the Sun report, a local source confirmed to the Sun that food was delivered by award-winning the Capital Indian Restaurant, the Durham Miners Hall, on April 30th last year. They said there was a lot of food. It came to at least £200 and would have fed 25 or 30 people. It was a late-night delivery, the last order of the night. It must have been placed about around 9pm, maybe. Last orders are at 10pm and everything at the restaurant is freshly cooked, so it would have taken time. A man came to the door to collect it, but it wasn't here. 
that figure of 30 people has now taken on a life of its own with journalists and Tory MPs reporting it as fact. But it's based simply on the size of the takeaway order. So it, it doesn't necessarily take 30 people to spend 200 quid on a takeaway. But of course, the key question is this. Did any of this, however harmless it might look, break the law? Well, on the 30th of April 2021, we were in stage two of the roadmap out of lockdown. Mixing indoors between people from two or more households was not allowed, except when, quote, reasonably necessary for work. And it was clear that socialising at work was also not allowed. Some Starmer allies have pointed out there was separate guidance for people involved in election campaigning after the 29th of March. So. In, in, in the run-up to those elections. But unfortunately for Starmer, that only allowed outdoor mixing. So it said, from the 29th of March, the provision for six people or two households to meet outdoors may support organisational work by campaigners and the holding of meetings outdoors. At this stage, there will be no change to the rules on meeting others indoors. In other words, except when vital for work reasons, mixing indoors was not allowed, which is why Starmer has tried to argue the curry and beer did in fact take place within the context of necessary work. That evening, from memory, we were doing an online event for members because we have this get out the vote thing for the last few mm. days, which is to get members going. I was doing pieces to camera, which we pre-record to send out at other times. We were clearing documents, we were preparing for the next day, we were doing all the things that we have to do. This is what we do when we're on the road, because right. we're out all day. Now, we were in the office to do that work. At some point, this was um, in the evening, everybody's hungry and a, and a takeaway right. was ordered. It was then delivered into the kitchen of the um, offices. When it sounds very and, uh, much okay. like a no, birthday no, no, cake just, no, no, at I mean, an event just... where people were working, which is exactly well, well, what the or, Prime or Minister in Durham, all restaurants has said. And... A potential difference between the birthday events, that's Boris Johnson's birthday event and Keir Starmer's curry, is that one was at the height of the first lockdown and the other was a year later. They were very different political situations. There's also much more evidence Boris Johnson is a repeat offender. But Keir Starmer's main defence had been that Johnson's birthday led to police fines and his curry didn't. And given that context, it's no surprise that Tory politicians have been pressuring Durham police to reopen investigations. That includes Nadine Dorish. She tweeted, We are expected to believe that a curry and beers arrived for about 30 people at 10pm and this was a break for a work meeting. No reasonable person believes Labour's story. So why do Durham police? And what were they told? On this question um, of what the police think, Starmer didn't exactly help himself with this performance on Tuesday. We are in the midst of a local election campaign. Lots of claims, counterclaims being made throughout this. One of this is about, and it's a long-running issue, about whether you broke the rules during lockdown. And I just wondered if you could clear up something for us. Was Has there been any contact with you or your office from Durham Police since Conservative MPs called for inquiries to be reopened? We were working in the office. It was just before elections. We were busy, we paused for food, no party, no rules were broken. That is the long and the short of it. All that's happened in the last week is that with local elections on the horizon, local uh, Conservative MPs have decided to chuck mud. But you can see why they're doing it. You can see why they're doing it. You can see why they're doing it. You they're doing it. questioning of Boris Johnson well, in the House of Commons about these kind of issues. And I know that you haven't answered my question, which is about contact from uh, Durham Police. Have there been any contact with you or, or the office in recent weeks? The police looked at this months ago and um, it came to a clear conclusion that was uh, no rules were broken. And that's because no rules were broken. Broken. Not quite. All the I rest asked. I just wondered if they've been back in touch since the since the you know local MPs have been raising questions about it. Well, look, um, they've already concluded their investigation. No rules were broken, and this is simply being whipped up as mudslinging by the Tories. But you um, must remember, if the police had rung up your if, office, if the Conservative Party put as much effort into answering the question, how are you going to help people with their energy bills, as they're putting into this mudslinging, that actually. Um, do a service for millions of people who are really worried about their energy But bills. by not this answering is... questions like mine, aren't you adding to the clouds of doubt around this? Well, there's just... We were working, we stopped for food, no party, no rules were broken. I don't know what I could add to that.
Labour would go on to confirm that Durham police hadn't in fact got back in touch with them and Keir Starmer was just unsure at the time. It goes without saying that interview wasn't particularly persuasive and that dismissing questions about potential rule breaking as mudslinging doesn't stack up too well when Starmer has used Partygate to call for both Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson to resign. It sounds a little bit like he's being hypocritical. But, and this is important, on the hypocrisy front, there are worse examples than Keir Starmer. This was Nadine Doris. She tweets, The man who wants to one day be Prime Minister cannot behave like this. He has a responsibility to be open, honest and transparent with the public. Dahlia, is Nadine Doris in a strong position to type out a tweet like that? God, I just... Lord, give me a degree of her shamelessness. Like the things I would do, honestly. Uh, I mean, it's obviously entirely nonsensical. If Nadine Doris believed that a threshold for being prime minister is being open, honest and transparent with the public, then she would be calling for Boris Johnson's resignation like yesterday. Um, but of course, this is just a classic uh, political strategy of when you are mired in political scandal, you just kind of kick dust into people's eyes to try and create uh, confusion. I also think it's an attempt to create a kind of both sides narrative um, in the lead up to, to the May elections to kind of make people feel disaffected and therefore to not vote at all, because I think they're aware that they probably haven't won many votes. They probably lost a lot of votes, but they're trying to at least make sure that those votes stay at home rather than go to Keir Starmer by playing into this. Well, we're all the same. What can I what can I say? Of course, the evidence that of a takeaway being delivered to an office on one occasion is not the same as a government throwing multiple parties and social gatherings, especially in the height of the lockdown, it tells us that people had dinner in an office. Uh, there just isn't the evidence that it was happening on the same scale, that the consistent and flagrant violating um, of the rules was happening on the same scale um, as it was for the Tories. And I guess the question is, to what extent will this pay off in as, a, as a gamble for the May elections? Because on the one hand, the media are absolutely kind of allowing it to unfold as a narrative. And I think that the top line that a lot of people will take away, uh, particularly when you think of the kind of headlines that are coming out of this, is going to be very much like, well, they all broke the rules, uh, even though it, it that is not an accurate reflection of actually what took place. But I also think on the other hand, when you then have a Nadine Doris or you have the Tories coming out and pointing fingers at the Labour Party, um, when they have actually been fined by the police, uh, it does also add to that sense of a kind of sleazy, disingenuous uh, Tory reputation uh, that I think is at the forefront of, of a lot of people's minds. So I think whether or not this gamble has paid off, we're going to see um, in the May elections. But that is absolutely why uh, the Tories are gunning for this particular narrative, because as they can see it, it's the only pathway to a May election that is not complete and utter uh, disaster. I think you're being unfair to Nadine Doris Dahlia because I think you've forgotten the Prime Minister tells the truth. The Prime Minister doesn't lie. You, you, you must not have been listening to all of her interviews. She, she's been very clear about that fact, Dahlia. It's come to light that local Tory candidates are so terrified of being associated with Boris Johnson's government that they're printing this on their leaflets. This Thursday, please don't punish local conservatives for the mistakes made in Westminster. We are local and proud of where we live. And like you, we want the best for Hartley Paul. Best wishes, Jane Reeve. Um, that's, as is clear there, a leaflet from Jane Reeve in Hartley Paul. It's a claim that also appears on a leaflet for James Brewer in the same ward. And in London, 400 Tory candidates have rebranded themselves as local conservatives. That actually appears on the voting slip. I think it's, it's, it's surprising that they get away with this, but on the voting slip, it says local conservatives, Labour Party, Green Party, the normal names of the parties, and then you've got local conservatives. So they seem like they're sort of some independent organisation who just happen to be conservative, but have nothing to do with that Boris Johnson who breaks all the rules in Downing Street. Um, Dahlia, it seems a little bit desperate, doesn't it? They are clutching uh, at straws because that headline narrative, because let's not forget, 
this isn't just a Boris Johnson problem. What the Partygate scandal revealed was that this is an endemic problem that exists at multiple levels of the Tory party. As you know, as we've talked about before in this show, those party invites were not just sent to five or six people. They weren't in this kind of tight little circle of people who knew that the rules were being broken and were trying to do it very clandest clandestinely. It was emails and invites that were emailed out to hundreds of people. And we only found out, what, a year after the fact? So I think that this uh, these leaflets, which are hilarious, by the way, I actually wish that, I mean, they wouldn't dare put one through my letterbox because I live in the most Labour stronghold uh, part of London. But I almost want one just for the for the gag value. Um, but I think that this is a, a, an evidence that at least within the internal Tory polling and within uh, conversations that these uh, councillors are having with their local communities, that this isn't just seen as a Boris Johnson problem, it is seen as a conservative problem. And so that is the, the thing that they are trying, they are trying to shift. And I, and I hope that they will not be successful. Um, thank you so much for joining me tonight, Dahlia. It's been a very enjoyable show. Um, and thank you all for watching. You can join us again on Friday night from 7pm. And that'll be a big show because we'll be talking about the election results. Of course, I'm sure you know, tomorrow there are council elections in Scotland, local elections in Wales and in England. There are mayoral elections and local authority elections are happening too. In Northern Ireland, the Assembly is up for elections. So there will be a hell of a lot to talk about. We'll see you then. You've been watching Tisky Sour on Navarra Media. Good night. <laughs>